a treat. I got to sit down and talk about reptiles with world-renowned herpetologist Mark O'Shea, arguably the most famous living herpetologist. We talked about research he's been doing. We talked about King Cobras, Anacondas, new books he's got coming out, his work in Timor. Uh, we talked about his TV days and lots more. We talked for nearly an hour. Exciting stuff. That was a real treat for me. And uh, I've got that interview coming up for you in just a minute. You're listening to the Edgar Ortega Radio Show. I interview people about topics that interest me. And I share those with you fine people who uh, share the same interests. I do a lot of animal, wildlife, conservation, and pet topics, as well as other things. You can uh, find my previous interviews on my YouTube channel. Just follow this video to the channel, and please subscribe. That way you'll never miss an episode. Also, follow the Edgar Ortega Radio Show on Facebook and Instagram. And remember, sharing is caring. So please be sure to share this video on your social media, and leave a comment below letting me know how much you enjoyed the program. If uh, if you're interested in frog conservation, please watch my interview with Dr. Kerry Krieger of Save the Frogs. That's up on my channel. What's coming up? Um, I'm gonna get up some. I'm gonna get some experts in their fields and uh, have them talk about whale and shark conservation issues. That should be fun. That's one of my missions here coming up here soon. So watch for those interviews. Um, yeah, that should be lots of fun. If you uh, consider yourself an expert in any field of conservation and would like to chat, please contact me through my radio show Facebook page. I do interviews all week. It was great sitting down with Mark O'Shea. He is a brilliant man. I could listen to him talk about snakes all day. There's so much uh, we can learn from him. If you're a field herper or a herpeticulturist, uh, if you breed reptiles or a field herper, he has in this interview a very special message of encouragement and a mission for all of you. So be sure to listen to the full interview for that. Make sure you catch that. Uh, many of you know uh, Mark O'Shea from his television days when he hosted uh, O'Shea's Big Adventure, taking us around the world giving us a glimpse into the world of herpetological research out in the field. One of the great things about uh, that program, um, and when you see him finding animals on TV, is that you're not watching staged setups where they uh, have an animal that's been captured earlier and then they pretend to find it and talk about it. Um, if you remember watching the show, you're watching captures as they happen. And uh, I asked him about uh, that, so listen for that too. Great interview. Um, it was great to talk with him. It was super awesome. And uh, I don't fill my show with uh, a bunch of useless filler. I like to get right to the meat of the program. So let's go now to my interview with Mark O'Shea. Enjoy. All right, Mark O'Shea is a world-renowned herpetologist, author, photographer, lecturer, and globetrotting adventurer, among many other titles, spending his life studying the world's fascinating reptiles. He is here to talk about work he's been doing around the world, and hopefully we'll hear, we'll hear some of his uh, many adventures around the planet searching for reptiles. Mark O'Shea, it's an absolute honor to be able to speak with you today. I've been looking forward to this and uh, hearing about work you've been doing. Thank you so much for being on the program. You're very welcome. Thank you for asking me. Now, you are an absolute icon in herpetology. I try to <laughs> motivate people. Um, that listen to my program uh, to do their part when it comes uh, to wildlife conservation. And I talk, about, uh, I talk to other animal lovers who don't necessarily care about reptile conservation or reptiles in the wild. So you really are someone that uh, people do look up to, whether you know it or not, um, with your passion and your dedication to add to the body of knowledge of reptiles um, around the world. Just by you being here to speak with me today, um, it's a real motivation uh, for people with the conservation and education mindset. I mean, these are not animals most people put first on their list to concern themselves with for protecting. No, you, you, you're quite right. You, you're quite right. Um, people often shy away from reptiles. Um, and not that we want to make everyone want to go and pick them up, but um, they need to understand them and realize that they're just as important on the planet as 
as birds and mammals. Yeah, yeah, no, they're, and of course, uh, all the people listening that love reptiles, we love them, but it's just getting that message across of how important every yeah. species around the world is. Well, um, I've, I've just been preparing a, a presentation, um, which I'm doing for the students at the University of Wolverhampton on uh, conservation of British reptiles, and I'm, I've got a three-hour session on Monday morning um, teaching that, so, uh, you know, it's not just in the states or in the tropics we're concerned about we don't have a very large herbert of fauna across here but what we do have we would like to keep yeah you don't hear a lot about british reptiles uh certainly not uh, now i've followed some of your activities over the past year or uh, two i know you've been uh, traveling visiting museums doing research and lecturing uh, this past year uh, I remember when you were in the in the united states a while back uh doing museum work i think over on the east coast here well, yes, yes, I was. That's that's um, probably about 2014, I think. I I was um, I was uh, awarded um, a, an Ernst Mayer Travel Award by um, uh, Harvard University to go across and work on their specimens, um, work on the genus Toxica calamus, which is an Elapid genus from New Guinea that most people haven't heard about. They don't kill people. They're secretive, but they're fascinating. And I, I had a travel award to come across and work on the, the specimens in the Museum of Comparative Zoology, the American Museum of Natural History, and the Smithsonian, the U.S. National Museum. And I found a new species sitting in a jar in the, at Harvard. So yeah. that, that really paid off. Yeah, it's amazing. A lot of the work uh, that done in herpetology, discovering new species, is uh, done kind of uh, with the tedious work that's done, not necessarily always out in the oh, field. Oh, I take issue with the word tedious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I absolutely love working in museums on specimens. They are treasure houses. They are so exciting. People think, well, it's dead, so it's it's not exciting. Wrong. You don't know when you open the jar if what is in the jar is what it says on the label. I mean, it could be complete. It's like rolling a log right. and not knowing what's underneath it. You know, it's the same thing. And um, I find it thoroughly fascinating otherwise I, I i mean harvard they gave me um a pass card to let myself in in the morning and let myself out in the evening so i was letting myself in at seven o'clock in the morning working straight through i don't eat at lunchtime and going home at nine o'clock you know and i was having a really good day it was absolutely fascinating and yes dead reptiles are interesting no, no I, I stop for road kills. I always stop for road kills. <laughs> they might not preserve those. It might be a bit ripe, but I still want to know what it is. No, absolutely. Even here when we're looking for animals on the roads at night uh, in the summer months, uh, we stop for every dead thing, see what it is, just to document, see what's uh, in that area. No, uh, so it's a, lot, it's a lot of fun work for you. If you love what you do, um, you have a good time with it, whether you're in the field or mm. in the lab, or just looking at museum specimens, which you enjoy. Yeah, in 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 in, in museum is another version of in the field. It really yeah, is. Yeah, I guess you're out there wherever the animals are. Um, tell me a little bit about the work you've been doing, or uh, anything new in herpetology. Is there anything you can talk to us about? Oh yeah, I'm sure. Um, I, well, I'm working on two books at the moment, so that's taking quite a lot of time. It's, it's normal to work on one. Two at once. But I'm working. I'm working on the um, second edition of um, my 19, when was it, 1996 Guide to the Snakes, Papua New Guinea. I mean, that's been out of print for 10, 15 years. And um, I'm working on the second edition for that, and it's going to be 150 plus species. Um, and that's why I'm doing so much museum work, because I found that if you just accept that somebody says there's a specimen uh, from this locality in this museum, and you you put that spot mark on your map. You're rather trusting to the to the person having identified it correctly. And so many of these specimens I've gone and looked at, and they've been wrong. And it completely throw your distribution maps out if you just take everything as gospel. So I've I've been looking at a lot of specimens across the board, Papuan snakes. In I think I've probably been in 24 museums now around the world. And include us. I've just spent time in three Australian collections, or is it four? Uh, four uh, South Australian Museum in Adelaide, Australian Museum in Sydney, National Museum of Victoria in Melbourne, and the uh, Australian National Wildlife Collection in Canberra. Um, so I'm working on uh, the rewrite of Snakes in New Guinea, and I'm working on another big book. Um, 
the book of snakes yeah the book of snakes now some people will have seen um tim halliday's the book of frogs which is a superb book it's the same publisher it's the same vein it's to sit alongside it 600 species so i've been writing a lot Wow, that's uh, exciting. Any ideas on uh, how far that project is uh, being completed? That's for a 2018 publication date. I'm not sure when. I think towards the beginning, uh, first half of the year for that. Um, I have to have it completely finished by November. Um, well on the way. Uh, last July, they wanted the first 100 species accounts. I gave them 400. I mean, uh, I may as well get on with it and get it done because what I don't want is to find that I need to go and do some field work and I can't because I haven't finished the book. Yeah. So a, a stitch in time saves nine, you know, get on with it. So I, I, I wrote all the accounts and now I, if we can't get a photograph for something because we're illustrating 600 species, I mean, that is one in six of the world's snakes. There's, my last count was 3,663 species of snakes. So it's, it's about one in six. So some of them are hard to find. They haven't been photographed. And in that case, I have to rewrite the account and uh, substitute something else. But um, it's, it has been great fun. It's been a real challenge, but it's, 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 it's been quite exhilarating to sort of hit the sort of 50 account marks, the 100 account marks, etc., etc. Still got all the introduction to write. We're sorting photographs at the moment. I'm doing all the distribution maps for 600 species. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> it's, um, and writing scientific papers as well. I've got one with a new a description of another snake going away for peer review shortly. And, and, and writing lectures for the university and for overseas. I'm speaking in Germany in April. I'm in the States in July, of course. Oh, what are you doing I'm out here? I'm speaking at the International Herpetological Symposium. Oh, wow. and, and a week later, the biology of the snakes. So I'll have two presentations, one at each. So I'll be in New Mexico, down at Bob Ashley's place on the New Mexico-Arizona uh, border, which I absolutely love that area. No, it's great. I, I love going to Arizona looking for a lot, a lot of variety of reptiles there to find. Um, on that uh, publication date for 2018, was that the uh, Papua New Guinea? That's book? the Book of Snakes. Book of you snakes, see, that's what so I was commissioned, yeah. approached to write. Um, the the other one um, is is very much my project. And although I've talked to a couple of publishers um, um, who are interested in this, I haven't settled on that absolutely yet. And 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 that requires more museum work, more field work. So that's a, a steady, uh, you know. We've, this, I know there's a bunch of new species to be described. There's other um, scientists working on uh, other thing, other species um, from New Guinea. So I don't really want my book to come out and and their papers get published two months later. So I'd yeah. rather <laughs> I'd rather wait and you know include them once they've published. So I'm not in a, a desperate rush, and <laughs> you know it, it would be nice to get it finished, but I'm enjoying doing it. Yeah, that'd be you nice know? of putting out two books at the same time. Um, no, well, that'd be, a, that'd be a bit going, <laughs> two at the same time, yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that people will be satisfied with the book of snakes while I finish off the, the New Guinea book. No, we look forward to that, as well as I'd love to get down to the, some of those herpetological symposiums. I know I've been planning to do it a few years, haven't been able to do it, so maybe that'll be one we can do. Now, you've done a lot. Yeah, I, I, I haven't been over for a good few years. I was yeah. I came... Um, I was going to the biology of the rattlesnakes, which was in Tucson, but I, I couldn't get to that because my brother was ill. And then I, I arrived right at the end and we all went up to the, the IHS at Fort Worth. And that was the last um, symposium I think I've been to in the States. Um, I've, I've been speaking in Australia recently. In fact, last year was mega for speaking. I started out at the beginning of the year speaking to a symposium in the Czech Republic um what three three presentations there um then um september i was in costa rica speaking at um the herpetological symposium there and that is a fantastic venue i do like costa rica then up to mexico for a veterinary symposium um then home for about two weeks then australia to do the museum work but to speak um, to the Australian Herpetological Society, a big evening event that they'd arranged there for me to speak at. And also University of Melbourne, I did um, a seminar. 
And then on the way home, I stopped in Sri Lanka to do a lecture for my university, um, for, for a college in Sri Lanka. So uh, it was a busy old lecturing year last year. Well, that was great, and very fortunate audiences to get to hear you speak. Um, it's great. Anybody interested in uh, herpetology, the academic side of it, can hear some great lectures at any of those symposiums and here in the United States, too. Now, I was going to ask you, you've done a lot of work in uh, East Timor. Um, oh, can, yeah. Can you talk about yeah. some of the work there and some of the species? Certainly, yes. Well, I don't know if you're familiar with the history um, of East Timor, or Timor-Leste, as it's called now. Um it was a Portuguese colony. Now, it's been a, it was a Portuguese colony from the 16th century uh, when most of the rest of the region was Dutch. It was a, the Dutch colony, which became Indonesia. And the Portuguese uh, gave up their colony and pulled out in 1975. And within a week, the Indonesians had invaded, annexed the country. There were a group of... Um, in Western journalists there who were photographing and documenting this invasion over the border. Um, they were all murdered and their bodies were burnt. Um, they then followed 21 years of bloodshed, which cost at least 100,000 Timorese lives fighting for their freedom. This is a, this is a, a, port, well, a Portuguese speaking Catholic country invaded by their large neighbor. And, um, they got independence in the end. They, they, were, they were annexed as a province of Indonesia. Indonesia pulled out in 1999, but the bloodshed shed continued with militia coming over from West Timor, and uh, a lot more people died. So the UN came in and broke all that up, and um, Timor got its independence for the third time in 2002, and it's been very peaceful ever since. And it's a lovely place to work. And um, we went, uh, Hinrich Kaiser, who many, many herpetologists will know, he, um, he uh, teaches at Victor Valley Community College in, in California, but he, he lives in Maryland. He commutes every week. That's a commute for you. Um, <laughs> he, he, he asked me if I was interested in joining him with his project. And we've been um, running, we were running the project from 2009 to 2014. We did 10 trips there, taking first Amer American students, later on German students joined us, and Timorese students. So we've, we, we've had um, Amer Californian and other American students and Germans from the University of Marburg and Timorese students from their national university teaching them field work. We've been doing a complete survey of the whole of the country of Timor-Leste, all 13 districts, um, their exclave of Akusi, which is completely surrounded by West Timor, and the two islands, Ataro and Jaco. Um, and we recorded some 70-odd species, of which a good 25 are new to science. We've got to write up. We've got to get these published. Um, and um, we, we were very fortunate. I mean, we, we had uh, the full support of the president and the prime minister of the country. You know, we used to go around to the president's house for dinner of an evening to, uh, to uh, after the project, the end of the project, um, to tell him what we'd uh, what we'd been doing. You know. <laughs> So it's it, tremendous. So we've got a lot of work still to do on that now, all the all the writing up and so forth. Um, a lot, everything we've published on that and our field reports can be downloaded from my website. My website's uh, www.marcoshea.info. And if you then put forward slash timor.php, um, it'll take you to the Timor page and all our papers are there and reports and Lots of photographs and everything. And it's a tremendous project. Really interesting. No, it's great. I've seen uh, some of your film reels from there, catching monitors and other animals. It's uh, Oh, it's, yeah. It's something. Yeah, they, 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 well, that, uh, we think, is a, a, a new um, new taxa. We don't know, subspecies or subspecies yet. But the specimen, we've got a, a holotype uh, University of Bonn with Wolfgang Bonn, who is like Mr. Monitor Lizard in, in Europe. So yeah. that could be new. No, that's exciting stuff. I mean, you're always doing something exciting. None of it tedious for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> the long journeys, sitting on airplanes. Yeah, that's the boring part without the reptiles. And airports and airplanes. 
God yeah. th thank us for having an iPad that we can upload some films or books and actually kill the time. Turn long haul into short haul with your iPad. No, it's great, and that you can do that full time. It's it's amazing. A lot of us dream about being able to do that. Um, so you're real inspiration for that. Now I, I have a lot of herpetoculturists that uh, listen to me, and they're fascinated with uh, things that happen in the reptile. Or uh, one of the particular things they're interested in is. Um, when large uh, large boa parthenogenesis, um, you recently oh you, yes you recently yeah documented, anaconda yeah yeah a case of parthenogenesis in a green anaconda. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, it was a bit of a surprise because we 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 in the I'm consultant curator of reptiles at a, a big safari park. I set up the reptile collection there 30 years ago, and I'm still still run it. Um, although I'm away an awful lot, so I rely an awful lot on the staff. They they have months when I'm not around, so that suits them probably. Um, anyway, one of the one of the anacondas. We we didn't want to breed our anacondas, so our green anacondas. Uh, it was uh, two females in a big enclosure, and um, one of my colleagues came in and she saw. Uh, baby anacondas being born and of course everybody says oh you it's it's a pair it's a pair no they're not they're both females and it was the smaller one that was giving birth um and uh it turned out uh it was a small um brood you know which com yeah. fits with path and genesis yeah. small number she had eight of which five were dead they're all female and they're all yeah, yeah. so high high mortality low fecundity um, and um, all they're the all science. female, yeah. and uh, yeah, it's, it, it's uh, quite. It, it made the news because it was the first um, documented recording of uh, parthenogenesis in a green anaconda. But it's 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 a, it's a lot more common um, than people realise. This was facultative parthenogenesis um, because, of course, the only obligate parthenogenetic snake is. The flatpot snake, Bromley blind snake, Indotyphilops braminus, that's the only snake that exists as a female only, you know, there are no males. There are plenty of lizards, usually hybrids, in Mexico and in the Pacific and so forth. There's quite a few lizards that are obligate parthenogens, but a facultative parthenogen is when you have parthenogenesis in a normally sexual species, and that's what we had. And it's happened in rainbow bowers, common bowers, rattlesnakes, um, Komodo dragons, all sorts of things. No, it's really interesting. It's always uh, fun to see that. Um, of course, you usually see the few incidences of it in the news when it's documented. Um, so that's yeah. great. Now, it's important, you see, that when people should should document things, when something unusual happens, I'm forever telling the students this. If you, th I mean, a lot of your your listeners will go out into the field. They'll they'll go herping. They might see something, killing something or eating something. They go, oh, that's interesting. They take a photograph of it. They put it on, on Facebook. And three days later, it's spilled down the page and it's gone forever. And they thought, well, it's bound to have been reported before. So I won't bother. And often or not. Often or not. If somebody hasn't reported your observation, what you're seeing in the past, it's, it's as if it didn't happen. So it's always worth publishing properly interesting and unusual Natural history observations, no, always. No, of course, I've seen uh, field herpers, just people who do this as a hobby, go out and they notice. Uh, I, I think I had one friend who noticed uh, the, one of the first incidences in uh, of uh, of uh, cannibalism in a certain species. So, I mean, it's this sort of thing that yeah, uh, people, that's important. You see, that should be documented. <laughs> I've, yeah. Well, I've rec I reported cannibalism. Um, in Micropecus ikahika, the, the New Guinea um, small-eyed snake. It is, I mean, that's a really fascinating snake. I've, I've probably caught 80 or 90 of them now for venom research in New Guinea. It's an endemic to New Guinea. They're, they're very common on a volcanic island to the north, um, which has erupted twice in the 70s. So it's you, you, an island next door smoking half the time. Um, but you, you, you go onto that island and search through coconut husk piles. And I've, I've caught a lot of these New Guinea small-eyed snakes. So it's quite a decent size. They're lapid. It's, and, and it chews and chews. And it, it's venom's quite difficult to deal with. Um, the polyvalent antivenom works. Tiger snake antivenom works, but it's not licensed for use in the country. So, um, you know, people that are bitten by it do what people do die. And um, 
I've caught a lot of these and, and I've documented not just cannibalism in them, but I've also documented one preying on, um, on a ground boa, Candoya aspera, what people call a viper boa. Um, and also in New Guinea, I recorded um, uh, a brown snake, um, Pseudonarcha textilis. The populations in New Guinea are actually New Guinea. They're not introduced from Australia. I've just published a paper absolutely proving this now, um, which is available online. Um, so I found a specimen in a collection in Genoa, Italy, that's um, from the 1870s. So that's before the Second World War. So everyone was thinking, oh, they came in after the Second World War. No, they didn't. They were there before. Um, I, I caught one of those eating um, a Candoya pulsini, a Pacific boa one time. So <laughs> always document. Don't just go, oh, that's interesting and walk away or take some photos and put them on Facebook. No, get it published properly. Even if it's in, 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 in a hobbyist publication, it's down in print then. It's, it's, it's official. And sometimes these are people's first paper, papers, little natural history notes. Yeah, no, it's great that anybody can do that work and uh, really oh, yeah. not just take what uh, the books say uh, at face value, but if you notice something new, of course, uh, contact somebody who can uh, document that for you. No, it's great. Well, yeah, my, my, my rule of nature is there's only one rule in nature, and that is there are no rules in nature. <laughs> You're always discovering something new. Um, now, always. There's always something that bucks the trend. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Uh, now I wanted to talk to you. A lot of a lot of people know you. Back in the late uh, 1990s, you did two films that stood out to me and many other people who enjoy watching you. And this is kind of their first um, exposure to your work. And I'm speaking of the work you did with the Anacondas and the Black Mamba. Uh -huh. um, oh yeah, those two early films. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And Before so, Big Adventure. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the body of work along with Doshe's Big Adventure, where many of us came to know you. Um, have you done any recent uh, work for television? Uh, more recent than that, yes. Um, I did a couple of... Um, uh, it, it, there was a series made at the Safari Park. Oddly enough, it was called Safari Park. Um, and um, I, I couldn't get involved with the first series. I was busy with something else. But I, made, I, was, I did two of the second series, the last two, I think. Uh, for the first one at the Safari Park when we were setting up the new... Um, some new exhibits for the record breakers, the green anaconda, reticulated python, king cobra. And um, then I flew out to Namibia and the film crew came out with me and um, I, I went out to catch a zebra spitting cobra and I managed to get one while, while the film, film crew was towing along behind yeah. and a number of other interesting things. So so uh, that was that was pretty good. That was good fun. That's That's actually, I think, available online somewhere, YouTube or somewhere like that. Um, whereas the rest of my films, I'm always asked, where can we get your films? Where? I'm afraid that Animal Planet, in their infinite wisdom, said there was no market for my films as DVDs, and so they were never done. And the copyright, who owns it, is so complicated. I doubt they ever will be. It's a real shame. I'd, I'd love them to be available. Yeah, no, it is a shame. I mean, I know a lot of people that uh, would buy that whole body of work. Uh, but for now, I mean, I know there's some things people can watch on YouTube of some of your travels and adventures. Or, yeah, and there's not a lot of stuff reels. on there. So yeah. It's just getting around to doing the, to, to, to filming it and yeah, yeah, and um, and getting it put online. But there's there's, a, there's some there's some yeah yeah of course or to get more stuff on there. I mean, um, we we did a trip to Greece. Um, looking for Monty Viper's Anthena, the Ottoman Viper. Uh, we found 29. Wow. <laughs> that wasn't bad. We were yeah. only there four days. Yeah, wow. <laughs> They're big snakes. Oh. And, um, you know, that we, uh, our friend uh, Irvin Cyrus, he's a Norwegian. He was along with a camera and he filmed that. He tells me he's nearly got that um, uh, knocked into shape. So that will probably be going online at some point. No, it's great. One thing, a lot of the uh, people, uh, your fans out here enjoy that. Uh, it seemed like you were out in the field, and what we saw on video is what was really happening for the most part. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. When, I, when I started making those films, um, it was my golden rule, big adventure. No, no setups. We're not going to set anything up because, you know, I sort of listened to what was happening in the television business, and, and People were staging stuff, and I said, "No, I don't want. To, I don't want to do that. I don't want. To, we either find it or we don't find it." 
And there were occasions when we were really struggling to find things and people had offered to go off and catch one and bring it and drop it so I could find out. I mean, we went to, for a python once and um, I suspected that the, that the guy had planted it. And I said to the director, I'm not, I'm not going to go near that, turn around and walk away. Because it was integrity. Um, see, what I, wanted to, what I wanted to bring to the screen with, with Big Adventure in particular was not a lot of swashbuckling, sort of um, excitement, adrenaline-driven. What I wanted to bring to the screen was what I did anyway, which is real field work. I've been working in the tropics on research projects since the early 1980s, you know, in the Amazon, in New Guinea, in West Africa, in Borneo, all over. And what I wanted to do was bring field work to the screen. And, and Big Adventure, if you, if, you, if you analyze it, a lot of the times I'm actually introducing other people's field work. Not mine, other people's field work. So I've, I've got a contributor along and we're talking about something. When, when we went looking for tiger snakes on Chapel Island off Tasmania, um, I brought in Terry Schweiner, who'd been there studying them decades earlier. And it, so that was his, his project. You know, and a lot, all the films were like that, except one. When I went to New Guinea and made Magic Man, that was mine. That was my game. I was looking for Micropecus, the New Guinea small-eyed snakes, and I caught two during filming. So that was um, that was demo demonstrating some of my own field work. No, it's great and uh, very respectable. I think a lot of us that are really involved in uh, field herpetology um, would consume that up right away. I mean, right now it seems television's making things more for mass consumption. Um, so yeah, 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 yeah. So we really well. That it's we miss that. Well, yes, I, I, I think it, it, it is. It, I, I think I, my, the films I made were, were expensive to make. We were there a long time. Yeah. We, we were flying into remote areas, and you know, if they can. If he's going to spend three three weeks sitting, I spent three weeks sitting on the shores of Lake Tanganyika, trying every which way to catch a water cobra. And the only one I found was a, was one that had been killed by a fish eagle. No live ones. People were offering to to catch them in their gill nets up, up the lake and bring them down. I said no, um, and I worked hard to try and catch one. We did everything out in the day, out in the night, on the surface, on the rocks, on, along the shore snorkeling diving everything we didn't get one and um three weeks it was expensive yeah but we still made a good film i think it was a good film even though it the the cobra didn't make a didn't show up but there's a, a really um interesting story to at the end of that we were staying on in the zambian end of lake tanganyika and we were staying on a a little uh a little chalet set up on the, uh, which was attached to a fish farm for um um cichlids and we didn't see any tourists the whole time we were there we were the only people there we didn't when we were on the lake we didn't see any tourists and then when we left to head back out head, fly down to johannesburg um we got into a skiff and we get, went down the lake to Zambia's port, Mpubulunga, which is right on the southern tip of, of Lake uh, Tanganyika. And as we were going down, there's a boat went past and there were some half a dozen tourists in it. And they waved to us and we waved back and we didn't think any more to it. And um, up Mpubulunga, we went, we got a military flight down to Lusaka, the capital of Zambia. And then we got um, a, a commercial flight down to Johannesburg. I flew home with the rest of the crew and the director met with his partner and went for a two-week holiday in South Africa. The first week in Kruger National Park, the second week in Cape Town. And he was in a bar in Cape Town and two South African guys started to chat to him and they said, oh, is this your first time in Africa? And he said, first time in South Africa, but not my first time in Africa. Oh, they said, where have you been? He said, well, I've just come down from from Zambia. <laughs> oh, yeah. They said, where? He said, oh, I was on Lake Tanganyika. And they said, um, are you with a film crew with that red bearded guy, O'Shea? And, and he said, yeah, I'm the director. How do you know? He said, uh, when you were coming down the lake, 
a boat went past and some people waved to you and you waved back. He, he says, yeah. He said, well, that was us. We had our first holiday in Zambia. That was us. This is in Cape Town. They're in a bar, <laughs> right? Yeah. And it gets weirder. He, they said, um, you were looking for a water cobra. And he says, yeah, we didn't find it. They said, well, when we arrived, all the Africans thought that we were you come back. And they dragged us along the beach. And right below the chalet where O'Shea was staying, there was a water cobra in the shallows swimming around. <laughs> How's that for a coincidence? I missed it by half an hour yeah. after three weeks. How's that for a coincidence? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> you've got the whole of you've got the whole of Zimbabwe in between Zambia and South Africa. Yeah, wow. Well, no, it's it's no. a strange world. I'm sure you have lots of great stories like that. Now, I, I'm sure some of my listeners would uh, hate me if I didn't ask you about. Um, now, many people enjoy hearing about iconic species uh, in herpetology, especially those of us interested. Um, and one of those, of course, is uh, Ophiophagus hanna, the king cobra. Oh yeah. Is there yeah, any? Is absolutely. there any? Is there anything you've learned? I mean, uh, on this species, in your experiences, I know you had a run-in with one a few years ago. Oh, uh, yeah, that run-in was a bit overinflated by the media, wasn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, I, mean, I was bitten on the shoe. Um, she didn't mean to. I just, I was feeding her in the enclosure, and she missed the rat, and I just stepped back, and she followed my, my shoe because it was the same size as the rat, yeah. and she bit my shoe, and she envenomed that. And I handed her the rat, and she took that, and she went and ate it. And I, I came out. I was in there with, the co with a colleague, and I took my shoe off because my sock was soaking wet with venom. I mean, she put a lot in. Oh, wow. And as I took the sock off, you could have wrung the venom out of it because it had all just gone into the sock. Wow. And um, she hadn't bitten me. And I, and I, I, I took the sock off because I, I didn't really want to be wearing a sock soaked in venom. <laughs> and... What I hadn't noticed, of course, is I've got a couple of rubbed toes because I've been going um, sockless in boots yeah. So I'd, because it was hot weather. I'd rubbed a couple of my toes, and I must have brushed that with the, the, the soaking sock because um, I went out to do a presentation with a reticulated python in front of about 200 people, and I'm stood on the stage talking to them, and... I began to find that I was having trouble thinking about what I was going to say next, hmm. that I was having difficulty computing it. And then I realized I was actually having difficulty speaking and that my tongue seemed to be hard to move. And I realized oh. that I'd been envenomed. And I thought, ah, I don't really want to keel over on a stage in front of 200 no. people. <laughs> so... Um, I went back in and I said, my two colleagues, and they, they said, are you having problems? I said, yes. And they said, should we call the, you know, put the, the call out, the crash call? And I said, I think you're better. And um, I went and lay down and they put the call out, the emergency call. Um, we've got a whole protocol, obviously, any, any zoo would have. And um, my colleagues, they were, they were really good. They've practiced um, doing pressure back for um, a snake bite victim it's part of their training they've never had to do it for real and they did and they, there was no raised voices i just like that lay there and let them get on with it they, they, and they they were superb they worked perfectly not a raised voice not a what do we do now not not no worry at all by the time the doctor and the paramedics arrived i was trussed up like like a thanksgiving chicken turkey <laughs> right yeah and i was whisked off to hospital but um I was well aware as I'd been taken out to the ambulance, which took me up to the big car park where there was a helicopter waiting, the camera phones. My God, flash, 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 flash. <laughs> I thought, oh, this, this isn't going to end well. Thank God. And um, I was flown to the hospital. I took my antivenom with me, flown to the hospital, didn't need the antivenom, was out the next day. Um, it, it didn't get any worse. But you just don't know, do you? you, if you, you the, the people that die, the people that sit around and think, oh, maybe it's not going to be too bad. I won't call just yet. No, if you're bitten, you assume the worst. And, and I ended up going to hospital and it wasn't, it wasn't a bad bite. But 
The New Zealand newspaper reported my death that night. Um, some friends flying back to East Timor oh, wow. in Australia, the Melbourne to Darwin. They they um they watched my obituary. Uh, it was just it just got, it got oh, carried yeah. away. A little out of hand there for getting bit. Yeah, it's, too. it's yeah, and and the point is that news now they don't bother to check because it's so instantaneous that so often it's it's reported incorrectly. And and that was, you know, I wasn't Mark Twain said rumors of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but the King Cobra is, for me, the iconic snake. Yeah. I mean, um, one we caught um, in India when we were filming there, a female about nine foot. We wanted to test. Um, well, this, this is um, Bruce Young, he's an American uh, pathologist. His research was on King, some of his work was on King Cobra, whether they could hear because they have that low growl. And he wondered whether it was a, a, a form of communication. So we'd rigged up a big enclosure and we got the sound of a big king growling. So we needed to catch a smaller king and see if it, she reacted. And we bought it, was, it was a huge area we'd fenced off with a big tarpaulin sheet all the way around it was about eight foot high on stakes and we put her in there with the speaker and let her settle down and the first thing she did was climb up the one corner and get above me looking down on my head <laughs> so pushed her back in again yeah. and then um then we cut some little windows out to look through and when i was i was just whispering to the cameraman and I looked back and she'd come over to me again and she was looking at me and she started to sway. And I swear I saw her pupils move like almost like they're focusing on me. The snakes aren't out, I suppose. Well, OK, some of the tree snakes have got good vision, but king cobras, they see movement. They're not supposed to see shape. But she seemed to be able to tell the difference between the side of my head and the front of my face. Yeah. And she started to these. I saw her pupils almost sort of fixate on me and she started to sway. And I felt so guilty because I just had this feeling. She was saying to me, why have you done this? Why have you caught me? What have I done? You know, like, why am I in this enclosure? And I felt terrible. <laughs> so when we finished filming, the best moment for me was taking her and just letting her go again. That was, for me, the best moment of the lot was letting her run. Wow. And she went down the waterfall in the way. People talk of their, uh, it seems there'd be an intelligence there. Well, intelligence is a hard thing to define, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, Compared, I wouldn't call it intelligence like mammalian intelligence or human intelligence or even, or even um, you know, anthropoid intelligence, so apes and so forth. No, it's, there's something there, but whether, it's, whether it falls into intelligence, um, that's, uh, but there's definitely something going on behind those eyes that you don't get in other snakes. Right, yeah, that's what I was referring to. A lot yeah, of people talking about. Even, even common cobras. And I've, you know, I've caught lots of African and Asian cobras, and I've kept quite a few of them and, over the years. And that, that there wasn't the same responsiveness that you, that you got with a king. And my king, a, a sleeping beauty, her name was, she, she passed away uh, a couple of years ago now because she was, she was about 17 or 18. Um, she, she, she seemed to recognize when we were working with her. And if we had a new member of staff, she'd watch them. But she seemed to be okay with those of us who she knew. <laughs> so I, I, I want to be careful saying that yeah. um, I don't want to anthropomorphize. <laughs> recognize the new guy. <laughs> hey, yeah, but, you know, yeah, maybe it's the way he's reacting to her. I don't know. But uh, yeah, she, was, she was lovely to work with. Yeah, that could be a part of it. A lot of times, snakes react differently uh, to me when to, than with somebody. Uh, well, not yeah, familiar with people. Them. If yes, I mean, um, somebody will be holding a snake, and they'll pass it to somebody who's not familiar with snakes, and it'll be a bit more unsettled. Yeah, the, and and they think it's because it knows the person who's holding it. No, it's more the fact that they're holding it too tightly or too loosely. People who keep snakes know how to hold them, so the snake is comfortable. They know not to apply too much pressure and things like this. Whereas somebody who's nervous, the snake thinks I'm going to fall on the floor here. You yeah. know, so yeah, no. So it's it's bound to be a bit bit more unsettled, isn't it? And yeah. people making sudden movements, all all the things you that those of us that 
of no snakes tell everybody else not to do. Yeah, knowing how to read them as well. Now I could hear you talk. Yeah. About, I could hear you talk about yeah, green yeah. cobras all day, but uh, for the interest of time, we'll move on here. Now here in the United States, I mean, it's great watching you work with all these exotic species and hear of your reports around the world. But I'm curious if there's any uh, North American species that interest you. Oh God, gotcha. yeah, yeah. There's cursories. I mean, I, I when I come over to the states, I have little enough time in in to go into the field. Um, I'm, that's why I'm probably going to try and get a bit more time when I'm in New Mexico. Um, but I've also got to go across the California Academy of Sciences and work through their Papua and Snake collection. Right, so you'll, you'll be near I, me there, yeah. I'll be sharing the time between field and museum again. But yes, there are. But the funny thing is, it's not. It's not always a thing, the, the species that people think I'm going to be interested in, because, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go looking for big western diamondbacks or things like that necessarily. I'm fascinated by burrowing species, species with uh, secretive lifestyles, the small snakes. It doesn't have to be big and deadly to be interesting. And often these small burrowers get ignored. Yeah, and, um, yeah, you know, I, and those are the things that re- when when we when I was last over in Arizona and New Mexico with Bob Ashley and the guys, um, the snake that I was most impressed with, and we 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 we, we saw Willardi and Lepidus and you know, yeah. <laughs> quite a few Atrox and everything. And I, I caught a Mojave with my camera because I hadn't got anything else handy at the time. <laughs> um, just pinned down with that. But the thing that really made that trip for me was a Sonoran coral snake. That was something special and difficult to photograph. I had to yeah. build a set in the bath and get in the bath with a little mini mag light pointing at the ceiling to produce a bit of light and try and settle it in the bath in the set and photograph it there so I didn't lose it. So, uh, yeah, that, that was a special snake for me. The coral snakes, you don't see them that often. No, and they're quite different from the vipers that we have here in the United States. So the corals are kind of their own thing here. So no, those are really interesting. Yeah. Remember, well, there... you've got three corals. You've got three corals yeah, yeah. in the States. So that's more than we've got here. <laughs> yeah, I know. So it's fun. I know when you travel anywhere, um, any, everything's new and exciting. Um, it is, yes, yes. Well, um, yeah, we, we've, we've taken a few people out to see... Um, our adders here because there's, there's an adder colony 20 yeah. minutes from where I am and we love those snakes you know they're, they're beautiful snakes um, and for people coming from overseas I not Europe obviously because they've seen them but people coming from the States or Australia say can we go and see some adders so we'll take them and see some adders you know yeah uh, it's like going, it's like going out to one of your timber rattlesnake dens yeah yeah, no, and people uh, here in Northern California, even in Southern California, they don't see some of the species we have up here, and so they're excited yep. to see even the common things you see all the time. Yeah. Well, yes, but you see, the, 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 the really interesting things are the things you don't see, but there are things that you don't see living in your area. You know, um, rubber boas and things like that. Yeah, no, Interesting, we, secretive species. No, we love finding and, those, yeah. No, we love every species we find around here, but... The, yeah, the public and, generally knows the, about I, the scary because ones. Because <laughs> you've got dangerous stuff that tends to yeah. overshadow um, the other the other interesting species, and I think that's a shame. You know, I mean, obviously I'm a snake guy more than a lizard guy, but 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 a snake hasn't got to be venomous to catch my attention. No, of course, and that's uh, those non-venomous ones are the ones you can mm. gather interest in the public. Uh, Mark, I don't want to take too much of your time, but that's a good segue into my last uh, thing here. Um, many of the people listening, they look up to you um, in the work you've done and continue to do uh, in the realm of uh, herpetological research. So, um, you know, they have your ear. So right now, speak to the listeners about what we can all do to help preserve these often overlooked animals, these reptiles, uh, when it comes to wildlife conservation and educating the public. So in closing, give us your conservation message on reptiles. Well, I, th- I, I think that, that your, uh, your listeners are already doing half of that. They're, they're, they're going out and they're talking to people who aren't reptile people, and they're trying to convert them not into reptile lovers, but into people who will appreciate that reptiles do deserve to live and that it isn't our God-given right to kill every snake that we see. And there's no need for that. And also people get killed trying to kill snakes. Um, but what I said earlier about if you are out in the desert or 
out in the mountains and you, you see a, a species doing something a little bit unusual and you think, oh, I haven't seen that before. Don't just think of sticking it on Facebook. Write it up. There, there's, there, I mean, I'm helping a couple of people write notes for logical review at the moment. People, uh, There's an Indonesian lad that's just found something interesting and I'm helping put a paper together for him. And the, there's always going to be somebody, the local um, academic in the, in, the, in the museum or the university, who, if, if it's not been reported before, get it written up, get help doing that, get a publication under your belt, because it's not that hard. And it's then there for posterity forever. And if you're the first person that's seen something happening, that's, that's really, that's, that's a good feeling. That's fantastic, both in the wild and in a captive setting. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I see. Uh, we, we talk to a lot of people now doing research on uh, uh, reptile venom and the medicines that are being developed to uh, create these life-saving medications. Um, and there's all these new avenues now we can educate people about uh, reptiles um, and even amphibians. Mark, um it's been an honor to speak with you today. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to talk to us and motivate us, get us in that com conservation mindset, and uh, appreciate the education work uh, and all the work that you do. So thank you very thank, much. Thank, thank you very much. It's, it's been a great pleasure speaking to you. No, it was a lot of fun. I hope we can do it again sometime. But uh, Yeah, why not? This has been a treat. No, I appreciate it, Mark. Thank you so much for coming on the program. I hope to see you in New Mexico. Oh, yeah, or Arizona, wherever I see you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, it's at Rodeo, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's Portal Rodeo. You're right on the border there. Have you, have you been to the, the Desert Museum, the Chiricao Days Desert Museum that Bob Ashley runs down there? I haven't been to that one. Well, I've been to a few desert museums out there in Arizona, yeah. but I haven't been to that oh, one. Oh, yeah, no. Arizona, Sonora. Excellent. Yep, yeah, I hope to see some of you guys down, down at either the uh, IHS or the Biology of the Snakes. Yeah, and you'll be out here in San Francisco, uh, but I don't know if... Yep. Yeah. No. So it'll be I'm great. I'm hoping to. Yeah. I need to get to Calicut. No, you're a lucky guy. We appreciate all the work you do, Mark. Thank you so much. Very welcome. That was my interview with world-renowned herpetologist Mark O'Shea. Be sure to catch him at the 2017 International Herpetological Symposium, slated for July in uh, New Mexico. Mark O'Shea leaving us there with a mission for all field herpers and herpetoculturists to document new information and add to our knowledge reptiles. Thank you all for listening. Please subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Like, follow me on Facebook and Instagram. Please share this video. Get it out there. Leave me a comment below. My name is Edgar Ortega. You've been listening to the Edgar Ortega Radio Show.